Hi everyone, this is Bruno Aziza and welcome to another edition of Data Journeys. This is where you come to learn from leaders in data and analytics, people that have had amazing growth, incredible results, who tell us about their journey, also what uh, we need to do and what we need to avoid doing. Today, I've got the honor to be here with Joe from TELUS. Joe, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Tell us a little bit about TELUS. Perfect. Thanks for having me, Bruno. So I work at TELUS. TELUS is the third largest telecommunications company in Canada. We represent wireless, wireline systems. Um, we also have some interesting divisions in health, agriculture, and IoT. Our wireless division represents nine and a half million subscribers across Canada. So that's a fairly large sample of people within the country of 36 million. And my group specifically is TELUS Insights. Uh, our division was founded in 2015, and we're really focused on trying to commercialize data in a privacy preserving manner. So that means taking data that we have as a company and bringing it out to market in a way that the privacy of the individuals or the devices that the data comes from isn't being impacted negatively by anything we do and everything's looking at aggregates. Um, we really see this as a market differentiator compared to other data monetization groups um, at other companies. And we've seen this lead to a lot of the success with our product to date. That's excellent. So how to monetize data in a secure manner. You also have amazing scale. Tell us a little about the volume of data that you're dealing with and, and the types of inputs that you're getting. Yeah, so our primary data set we focus on is our wireless subscriber location. So it's location coming off of our network. We get network events anytime a cell phone talks to the network. So it sends a signal when it makes phone call, text message, as it migrates between towers or anytime it's been inactive for about 30 minutes or so. And so with that, we're building about 74 billion location records every month. And we have about 275,000 unique points of interest on the map that we split up into about 5,000 different unique polygons. And that number of polygons continues to grow month over month as more users start using our system and upload their own custom areas to look at. And this has resulted in us analyzing over 1.2 petabytes of data um, this year. So oh, that's quite incredible. So the products involved here are BigQuery, of course, Dataflow, PubSub, Composer, and a whole host of other products. You also analyze data in, in Data Studio. Tell us a little bit about the uh, the, the first use case here that you, you've been primarily involved in is the data for good uh, use case. Yeah, so when the pandemic hit um, in mid-March in Canada, we said as an organization, there's something we need to do about this and we need to provide data out in a way that reiterates our stance in the market towards privacy so really focuses on what we can and can't do with data but also gives access to that data to government organizations and researchers who have a real need and a desire to use data to inform their decision making and help them make the right decisions at the right time so we opened up to this concept our ceo signed off on it our chief privacy officer our chief data and trust officer i should say was really backing this and supporting it and so we've managed to in three weeks roll out a new platform um, on top of GCP that really allowed us to provide these insights and information to our government customers. We signed up 26 customers or 27 now um, since the pandemic started and have been able to provide them with information that can help them understand mobility patterns, what communities are interconnected, what health regions are interconnected, how far are people traveling on an average day, how well are people receiving public health messaging, and doing all of this with large aggregate data samples so that nothing's about individuals, it's all about communities and how communities are interacting with each other. And this has resulted in some really positive effects for various health groups across the country, which is something we're very proud of. And from doing this, we actually won the HPE IAPP 2020 um, Innovation and Privacy Award. So it's a very big deal for us, and we're very excited to have won that. It really shows that privacy differentiator is core to our product and really core to what we do. And it's really helped us gain um, traction with these government agencies. Well, first of all, congratulations. And, and then, uh, you know, it's amazing. Thank you for doing this for, for the community. You're providing a, a great service uh, to everyone. Now, you have been at Dallas for nine years and you've had a ton of uh, experiences. I want to kind of step back and take a look at overall, why did you choose Google and what has been the, the, the improvement you've seen compared to maybe on-prem systems? And then we're going to go into the do's and the don'ts. But first, why Google for you? Yeah, so before Google, we were trying to analyze this data using uh, an on-premise Hadoop cluster. It was 
what it was. Um, it tried to be powerful enough. We continued to expand that cluster. It was getting very costly to do so. We were seeing results to understand something like maybe a tourism region's visitorship was taking us about a month to produce a month worth of information. So we were kind of running at that bleeding edge where if we got one more data point, we wouldn't hit our deadlines for customers. So we were getting in this very concerned kind of mode of working where it wasn't right and we knew there was something better out there so we started researching what different things were out there and we came across bigquery and bigquery had a lot of benefits towards gis data specifically so all of this location data a lot of the analysis and a lot of the complex analytics really require standard geography libraries mm -hmm. and so what google has put into bigquery there for standard geography was a really strong differentiator for us and then the general support we saw from the google team so when we engaged google they were very good about providing specialists who would help us with architecture who would help our teams give us training really get us up to speed and comfortable and finally the fact that bigquery runs off of ANSI SQL meant that a lot of the stuff we've built in the past could be ripped out of the system it was in and placed up into the cloud quite quickly and quite successfully. And we saw that when we first migrated about a year ago, a large chunk of our data, and we were able to move some of our algorithms within days and get some very fast results. I think uh, we had a 25 times speed increase. So what was taking a month was taking a day to run. So it's a significant difference in just that caliber of result. And with that, we're also able to really really truly use our human capital as well as possible. So part of what we're running is consulting and you ideally want to reduce the number of man hours taken because when I'm sitting to pay a data scientist to watch a uh, circle spin on their screen while Hadoop's chugging away at a result, I'm still paying for their time whether or not that result's coming through. And so big queries also allowed us to do more with a small team and I, we couldn't have done the things we've done around COVID without the technology there. We hear this a lot from customers is typically, you know, big data yields to big questions, but the ability to go through the cycle faster, uh, you know, enables you to ask bigger questions, but also maybe better questions and maybe more questions. So it invites people to innovate faster without having to worry so much about the operational aspect of it. Now, you have learned a ton through uh, your experience. And, and I want to know first, let's start with the positive side of the equation. As you're learning what it means to become data-driven and, and be modernized in the cloud, what are some of the maybe two, three best practices you've learned in this process? I, I think the number one best practice is to keep on top of what's happening. Um, you guys are mm -hmm. launching new tools and new ways of looking at data, new pieces constantly, and the rollout is yeah. quick there's new stuff happening and keeping on top of that can really save you a lot of time. We found that sometimes it's faster to come to the Google product team and say, hey, we really want to be able to do X. And oftentimes you guys are already working on that and can give us a date when it's ready. So it's faster than us building it from scratch ourselves than having to replace it a few months later. So really keeping on top of kind of update logs, being involved in community forums, understanding what's happening with the product and how it's evolving. Um, that's a really big do and has saved us a lot of headaches and a lot of time. Getting close to the Google team kind of rolls into that, but understanding what the product team's doing, um, being close to your sales agents, understanding what they're providing and what they can help with. The team's been incredibly supportive. It's been one of the better experiences we've had. I've been in the software industry for about 10 years now, and I would say it's second to none in terms of the quality of service we've received. So really, really happy with that. And I think the closer you can get with the people you're working with from Google, the more you can gain from that. You guys are experts in your platforms and your tools, and you're willing to share that expertise, and you're very good at sharing that expertise in a very genuine way that helps us move forward as a business. We've been really happy with that. And the third one, something that I think is true for any data science team, regardless of where you're working, but give people the opportunity to experiment. Things don't always work the same in BigQuery as traditional database technologies. Things don't always do what you want them to do. You really want to give your people enough time to experiment and play and do R&D work um, if you really want to see the true success and drive those really big measures. If you don't give people time to kind of explore, they won't flourish as much as they really can with these technologies. There's a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of the thinking of how you have to look at data in BigQuery and how you want to query it, how you want to look at it. And giving people time to understand that play with it and experiment can really lead to some astonishing results. It can really improve how you're working with it. As much as things are ANSI SQL, and you can rip and replace, you can do significantly better if you take the time to look at how to optimize and how to play around with it. Thank you for, for the feedback. We're happy that you're happy. And it's true, if you're in the community, we have roles dedicated to your success from our you know, customer engineers through our uh, developer relations uh, team. And, and we have people really focused on making sure you're 
you're successful. I'm assuming you're also reading newsletters and, and other forms. What, who, what's your favorite form? I'm curious. So Chad from your GIS group has a community forum on Google Chats. He set up a really great forum there that has a lot of the leading people in the community and being able to see what people are posting about, see messaging, really get on top of that. And the other thing is the sales engineers. We have a lot of meetings with them to regularly keep up to date on what products are coming out, yeah. what's new and exciting. And I find both of those are the best ways of getting information for me because they, they're very knowledgeable on the products, more so than what I've seen from most sales engineering groups. They really know what's coming up and what it will do. And they also have taken the time to understand our problems and know where we're coming from. So they know if a product's a good fit for us. And they're often very on top of saying, hey, we have this new thing launching, you should check it out. And they know who to go to within our team. So they've been really, really good to work with. That's great to hear. And yeah, this community you're talking about is the, the what we call the DAC, the Data Analytics uh, Customer Council, which is a, a meeting that we have. We used to have this once a year, but now we have this every month. So it gives you more opportunities to connect with our roadmap and our uh, developer uh, organization, engineering organization. And then, of course, there's a group where you don't have to wait for the meeting. You can interact with the, us directly and the rest of the community. That's what it means to be part of the Data Analytics community at Google. So now that was for the positive. Let's talk about some of the uh, worst practices, some of the maybe the mistakes that you've learned along the way uh, that you would tell someone getting started today to try to avoid them. Yeah, the number one mistake is know what data you have duplicated where, how things are set up in terms of um, retention policies. We made a stupid mistake of one of our teams had accidentally set a default to uh, retain data for three years after deletion. So we thought we were deleting data and we're watching our bills go up and up and up and couldn't figure it out. We reached out, we submitted support tickets and someone from Google realized what was going on and corrected it for us. But it really taught us a big lesson about cloud expenses can go way up. I mean, relative to the human capital costs, again, that we were seeing before on our old infrastructure, this is pales in comparison. Like we really didn't pay nearly as much for these mistakes as we were paying to have people sit at a computer. So it was a good lesson to learn, but I would suggest people are careful with things like retention policies. Make sure you have the right data and the right environments. Don't over replicate your data if you don't need to. Use things like views to allow data to be accessed across environments. Use the tools that are there to be successful. It's not traditional database management. You have to treat it a little bit differently. So that would be my number one one because that has mm -hmm. um, some costs associated with it. And it rolls into my second one, which is really don't be afraid to fail at this. Like things are gonna go wrong. You'll be able to correct them. You'll be able to stand it back up. Again, we launched a major product in three weeks um, that was meeting a very serious need in the market for data around COVID. It's not something we could have done on our old infrastructure. A lot of us spent some very late nights in those three weeks getting that up and running. It was probably closer to six to eight weeks of actual work, but still it's something that can be done with this kind of tool behind you. And you can't do that on traditional on-prem things. Just ordering hardware alone would take you longer than that. So really the power is there. It just needs to be utilized. And you have to be not afraid to take that first step. And I think a lot of people are afraid to take that first step because they might get it wrong. And it's not a big deal because things are moving faster. You get something wrong, you can course correct much easier than you could in traditional hardware type database development. So the other one is don't expect this to magically fix everything. I think some of our team, um, especially at our executive level, we're expecting, you know, you go to the cloud and suddenly there's no more problems, everything's better brush your hands, walk away kind of thing. And it's really not that. This will fix some of your problems. It will introduce some new problems. You still need the support teams. You still need the infrastructure people um, there. Security development still needs to be there. The rules might shift slightly in what they're doing versus managing services versus managing hardware, but they're still needed. and They're still a necessary part of those teams. You're not gonna save costs on those kind of things, but where you will save costs are on the actual people doing the work and you'll be able to do more work with less people, which is really a bigger benefit. But don't expect just suddenly to be, you know, one data scientist spinning up an entire environment, fixing everything and solving all the problems for you. You're going to need teams to support these kind of things. And that's something that's just necessary regardless of where you go. That's great. You gave us a lot to think about. I mean, there's a lot here. It's a very rich uh, interview. Thanks for giving us the time today. I, you know, I have two things I think I, I want to highlight. This first uh, aspect of staying in touch uh, with the Google team, either through the field resources you have for your account or the many opportunities to forms and newsletters and, and groups that we have created for you. I really want to encourage everyone to do that if you're part of the community today. And then the second aspect you touched on, on 
uh, financial governance. You have to watch out for how you set up uh, your, your system, of course. But the good news here is because you're in the cloud, it's more than just your team uh, watching out, which I think is what you're talking about here, Joe, is that we managed to pick that up and then tell you about it, which is a great way to make sure that everybody's paying attention to how you're utilizing and paying for resources. Again, thank you so much for the time today. I hope people are going to reach out to you. You've got a lot to share, and we appreciate you taking the time. I'll talk to you soon. Perfect. Thanks so much, Bruno. Take care.